Okay, Anthony Drennan, welcome to the Tokyo Living Podcast. Thanks for having me, Sam. Um, so I might start just by uh, giving the listeners a bit of background on yourself. Uh, yeah, what sort of uh, brought you to this point in your career and uh, talk a little bit about your academic background um, and then we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll go from there. Sure. Well, um, I was born and raised in Japan, Tokyo, and uh, my father's mixed, my mother's Japanese, so I pretty much grew up here. I attended uh, St. Mary's International School. You're probably familiar with St. Mary's and coming again. And so I spent grade one all the way through through grade 12. And uh, I graduated from high school and moved on to the US like most of us back then, back in the 80s. Mm. And um, I did my undergraduate uh, education at Vassar College in upstate New York, okay. so on the East Coast of the US. And uh, back then, I, uh, I knew that I wanted to be a dentist, but um, I majored in uh, East Asian politics and economic geography. So that's way out there. So I, I knew that I'd, I'd be doing a lot of sciences in dental school. So I sort of did some other stuff that interested me. And then um, I got into uh, Tufts University in Boston, yep. Mass. So that's also on the East, East Coast. Yeah. And I did my uh, dental training there graduated in 97 and okay. then I did my residency at uh, the University of Connecticut Health Center which is okay. in Connecticut so a little bit down south from Boston yeah. yeah yeah I've always found it interesting the American university system because in Australia I mean yeah. it's changing a little bit now but you know I knew I wanted to be a physiotherapist so um you know provided a, I got the masks to get marks to get in once I finished high school, I was going straight into physiotherapy. Whereas yeah. uh, America is very different, you know, spending time doing Asian politics. Yeah, you know, right? <laughs> view of dentistry, it's a it's a different type of um, yeah. uh, different type of approach. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, and, and what was it about dentistry that um, that that took your interest? Um, you obviously sort of decided that on that fairly early on. Um, yeah. What was it about that that interested you? So what I did was uh, one summer I um, I uh, interned at. Uh, New York University College of Dentistry. So I was looking into different things. My father was in business, so I was looking at that side too, but I sort of wanted, you know, um, something where I could sort of run my own business or practice for that matter. And so, mm. but I was also interested in healthcare too. So I did some internships and then I ended up at, um, you know, NYU and mm. so did my summer there. And then I liked what I saw and, um, you know, people sort of, I, I talked to a lot of dentists there and they sort of uh, sold me on the profession. So, yeah, that's, that's yeah. pretty much, yeah, what made me want to become a dentist, yeah. Yeah. And then after your residency, well, um, did you stay and, and practice in the U.S.? Or Yeah, yeah. So, so I, uh, I work for several practices. So what usually happens is people either open up shop or... They would work in different practices, sort of see different styles, you know, um, different practices have different fortes and um, approaches. It can be either preventive or insurance based or you know, fee for service. So, you know, it's good to get uh, different aspects of dentistry and uh, while working and getting experience. So I worked in a couple of practices um, in the Boston area. Uh, Connecticut and also New Jersey where I finally ended up at um, and I opened up my own practice in uh, 2000 in okay. Princeton. yeah so I had a practice there yeah oh cool yeah and then um, you, what what uh, made you make the move back uh, back home to Japan back home? yeah so you know Tokyo is home for me um, yeah. family moved back and my parents were getting older, and uh, my brother's the expat type, so he's, he's you know, he was all over the world. I, uh, I decided, okay, you know, I, I, I like Tokyo. I like the to you know, city life. Yeah. I always grew up in the city, and uh, Princeton is a little bit more uh, suburbia. Yeah. Mm. So I took the big leap and decided to sell my practice to another, you know, plenty dentist, and decided to come back but it was a long journey actually because I had to retake the uh the Japanese dental boards again which was right. total you know it took me a total of about two and a half years to actually you know, 
first application process. You know, I need to send in my uh, all the documents about this thick, hand delivered <laughs> to to the <laughs> Ministry of Health. You know, I remember calling him from my practice. I said, "Well, I have all the documents. You know, when can I uh, can I FedEx it over to you to your attention or the Ministry of Health?" He told me, "No, no, no. I have to. You have to come in." Um, Handler. So, boy, I had to cancel my patients because the deadline was like a week later. <laughs> so, I thought, oh my God. I flew to Tokyo. Next day, I handed him the papers and then spent the night next, uh, the following day after I was back in New York area. He calls me a week later and says, You have an interview. <laughs> so, I was like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, so I did, you know, I, I took the exam. I had to do the Nihongo uh, Noriyoku Shiken, right? Yep. And then um, I did my residency right. in, in the hospital to manage a residency. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and when was that? When, when, uh, when did you start making the move back to Japan? So I, uh, I moved back in 2008, uh, 2007. Mm. 2007. Okay. And I actually, um, I attended a prep school for the dental boards. Right. Because, um, you know, I took the exam once before I failed because I thought, okay, the clinical section is going to be a breeze. And then I feel the clinical section. I've been practicing for 10 years. I thought, whoa, you know, what's going on? You know, this is strange. I took the prep course and I thought, oh, okay, you, you know, you're probably familiar. Japan is very, you know, there's, there, there's, it's very structured, structured and good in a bad sense, you know, you have yeah. to do it their way or no way. So yeah. um, my clinical experience really didn't mean much. Right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so to re relearn and uh, yeah, be re-examined all that theory stuff. Yeah. yeah. And it's all based on insurance type dentistry. So, okay. yeah, that's what threw me off. Yeah. So I guess we sort of go into that now, but um, upon coming back to Japan and starting to practice out here, um, what were, uh, so what, what sort of environment were you practicing? Did you go straight into opening up your own private practice or did you work with other dentists out here first? What was your, um, yeah, uh, yeah what, what was the path so, to? Yeah. So I, I, I did my residency um, at a university hospital and that was my first actual um, sort of first experience working in a insurance type setting. And that was sort of, that was a good introduction for me because there's, the approach is totally different. You know? yeah. The amount of time you spend seeing patients different, you know, it's shorter too. And uh, there's restrictions in the type of materials you can use. So that was a good experience, but I've always wanted to sort of do what I did practice the way I did in the US here in Tokyo. And I was looking around and, and then I found uh, uh, Tokyo, uh, the medical surgical clinic and the owners back then, Dr. Fuji, the late Dr. Fuji and Dr. Marshall, they had mm. a dental section for practice. And uh, I called them and I asked if they were looking for dentists. And they were, yeah, you know, why don't you come over? And I started working there, so that was good. Yeah. So because I, I wanted to use my English too. And of course. a lot of my friends were expats, you know, children of expats and diplomats. So it was, it was a natural transition for me. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and so what were some of the differences that you saw um, coming from the States to uh, working in Japan in terms of dentistry practices? Um, you sort of mentioned there a little bit in terms of um, working in, under the insurance scheme and, uh, and how that differed. But I guess you sort of saw that in the States as well, that uh, you know, there was a, a, a big difference between the insurance model and the um, sort of self-pay model. Um, yeah, what, what, how, how was the difference between those two models in the States compared to the difference between those two models here? So, so I think in the U.S., um, you know, you have the fee-for-service, the, the uh, private insurance type patients, and then you have the um, Medicare or uh, low income, different states have different plans. So mm. you might have the low income um, insurance, you know, uh, insurance for low income families. And there are restrictions as far as um, the type of procedures and the coverages, but Usually in the U.S., the reimbursement's a little bit lower. So um, that sort of changes the way 
the type of materials you, you use, or it's mostly dentistry to get patients out of pain or be able to function back again. And so I think, um, you know, with the fee for service, uh, you, you know, U.S. insurance plans have a cap. Yep. On average, it hasn't changed since the 70s, actually. So you have a cap for about $1,500 to $1,000 in different um, levels of treatment have different coverage percentages. So uh, regular checkups, cleanings, x-rays, you know, any diagnostic stuff is 100% covered. And then you have the fillings, extractions, and root canals that are covered at 80. And then you have the bigger okay. stuff with the crowns, inlays, onlays, 50. And then some plans will cover for implants, others won't. So it, it all depends on you know, how much premium you pay every month. So sure. um, I think in the US, uh, most patients will try to maximize their insurance plus pay an extra for the type of treatments they want to have. Yeah. yeah. Whereas mm -hmm. in Japan, um, the in national health insurance was basically set up to um, get, you know, it's universal coverage. So. I think most everybody has to sign up for this uh, can't go up in, right? Mm. And so the actual objective is to get patients out of pain, but you have to follow their sort of algorithm. You know, you have to have a diagnosis to have treatments. And so that's how it all started. But lately now, you know, preventative stuff is sort of uh, picking up steam here in uh, Japan also. So some dentists, you know, you've probably heard of patient, uh, patients, you know, your customers telling you, yeah, I had, I wanted cleaning, but I had to go on like six times. So back in the day, they would only do cleanings for every uh, uh, quadrant or, you know, seconds. Yeah. That's how it's done. So you go on for, wow. one, yeah, you go on for like 40, 40, and it's like, whoa, you know. But that's and what, why was that? Just one side, then the other side is. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so is that just a, um, a reimbursement thing? Like you get reimbursed for a certain time period of treatment yeah. per session. And because of that, you have to go for several sessions to, to so do better. I, yeah. So I never really understood the reason why they do that. But mm. um, yeah, you, you know, everything is split up into yeah. So I think now a lot of a lot of the Japanese they want their cleanings, you know, busier society. They want a lot of the Japanese do want uh, full mouth cleanings, just like mm. in the West, you know, in the US, Australia, New Zealand. You know. But um, some dentists, you know, there's there's a very very nebulous part of Japanese, you know, regulations. You, you probably know there's black and white, but there's that gray nebulous yeah. area where, you know, some dentists will say, okay, our regulations stipulate that we have to do this excellence, but we can do the one mouth, one mouth, you know, full mouth cleaning, but we'll do it. We'll have you pay a little bit or, you know, everybody does it a little bit differently. It seems like and different crews do it differently too. So mm -hmm. Minato can do it differently from Yokohama. Really? Yeah. So I'm not, you know, I'm not a, a Hokan dentist, so I'm not really yeah. sure how they do it, but um, I do hear about that. Yeah, yeah. And are there, um, you mentioned the cleaning there. Are there other aspects of preventative um, dentistry that are done differently between countries? Yeah, so I think uh, fluoride, mm. fluoride treatments. Um, you know, in the U.S., uh, a lot of the states are fluoride. The water is fluoride. I think Australia, not every you know state is fluoridated too, but a big portion of the country is fluoridated. New Zealand, I think they have fluoridation too. The uh, UK is about, I think they're about, uh, the last time I heard they're about 10% fluoridated, but okay. fluoridation is, um, studies show that by fluoridating the water, uh, the caries or the decay rate goes down by about 35 to 40%. So that's mm -hmm. a big, that's a big difference. I don't, 10 kids or you know, four will be less prone to decay. So yeah. but I think in Japan, there might be a political thing or I don't know, um, maybe maybe the dentist uh, put some pressure on the government not to do so, but the schools are trying to fluoridate the kids now. Okay. Yeah, so mouthwash, you know, high fluoride content mouthwash. 
watched at school. I don't know how often I do it, but um, I just tend to do that. But I think um, in that sense, in the U.S., what we used to do is every six months, cleaning checkup. Um, and then fluoridation for kids up to about age 14. Okay. But the best time to hit kids with fluoride is between age of six months to about 14, 15, when the teeth are actually forming in the body. So you yeah. want to get the fluoride uh, systemically to them. Yeah. yeah. Whereas okay. in Japan, it's mostly, I think, like, uh, you know, dentists will do it. But I've seen kids who come into my practice where they went to Japanese dentists, so fluoride, uh, fluoride the kid, you know, do the fluoride trays every two months. Yeah. So okay. there's no set rule, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, I've not really, I don't I think in Australia, at least when I was growing up, there wasn't really a thing. Can you describe the fluoride trays and, and how that fluoridation process actually takes place? Yeah. So it's a, it's a higher con, uh, you know, concentration of fluoride compared to our toothpaste. So, we mm. use. so um, I, you know, I usually tell my patients, if you have about a thousand PPMs, a thousand five hundred PPMs in the toothpaste, mm. that's, that should suffice, yeah. You don't have to go for the, the really high content fluoride, but in the dental office, we'll hit them with a little bit higher fluoride content. You know, we can go up to like 4,500 ppm. So what, what we do is we'll use a little tray, we'll put the fluoride gel in the tray, and then put it in, in the child's mouth or the, the adult's mouth for about uh, a minute and a half, two minutes. Okay. Just uh, bombard the teeth, yeah. And then uh, a couple of other things that I want, in terms of frequency of checkups and, uh, and that type of thing, do, have you noticed any difference between you know, J Japan and, uh, and the US there? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, some of my patients who've been to Japanese dentists end up coming to me, they'll tell me that they were told to come once a month for cleanings. Okay. And um, whereas in the US it's mostly six months, if you're a high risk, uh, gum patient, you know, gum disease patient, periodontitis patient, then we would recommend having patients come in sometimes four months, every four months, or three months. Um, but studies show that the level of uh, the bacterial load in the mouth and the plaque levels, tartar levels, reach a peak after three months. Okay. So, yeah, but on average, most patients, six months is good. And I think in Japan, you know, um, different you know, like I mentioned earlier, different dentists will give different recommendations. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I've seen patients who've once a month, or once a year, or like others who are told to come once a month. And I think, um, you know, that, that's a little bit of a kill. Because if yeah. you're scraping the roots every month, you can get, uh, you can be, you can remove some healthy cells that line the really roots. yeah yeah yeah. Um, yeah yeah i think um, yeah okay we need to yeah no that's useful um in regards to uh, actual um, uh, work done on the teeth, so I know some people will go and see a dentist and, and they'll need to get fillings done, um, cavities treated, uh, but then they, other people or, or the same person might take a, a second opinion and the dentist says they don't have to do it. Is there a cultural difference um, between, uh, and obviously this is going to be different um, between different dentists, but have you noticed general trends in uh, how aggressively surgeons will treat cavities, uh, or, sorry, dentists will um, treat cavities um, based on region? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, just like you mentioned, if you have 10 dentists, you give them a set of x-rays, you have them look in the patient's mouth, they'll tell you 10 different things. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you can have a very conservative type of dentist, you can have a dentist who, who's a little bit more aggressive, thinking, okay, if this feeling is old, it's going to, get bad anyways, let's take care of the now type of attitude at the dentist. So, mm. you know, it's really hard to say, um, you know, if I were to compare a dentist in the US, in Japan, it's really hard to say because every everybody has a different um, level of uh, care, you know, the yeah. idea, you have philosophy towards treatment. But I think in general, um, in Japan, what I've noticed is, uh, so I have patients who go to Japanese dentist they'll come to me for a second opinion and um, you know they'll tell me okay I needed this number of fillings 
And I think um, it's very important to take a certain type of x-rays whenever we diagnose. So, you know, you're probably familiar. You know, I'll take, I'll look in your mouth and then we'll take an x-ray and then we come up with a diagnosis because certain teeth can be stained. But when you look on x-ray, although the x-ray is not 100%, it may take time for it to show up clearly, but, um, you know, we need to look at both yeah. conclusions. So staining doesn't necessarily mean decay. So I've noticed that if the tooth is starkly stained, so I, you know, I have some Indian patients come in, you know, they can, the, the, the diet, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the coloring of the foods can cause staining in their deep grooves. Okay. It may look like a cavity, but not necessarily. So mm. I, I see a lot of that actually lately. Yeah, interesting. And also, as far as the treatment protocol is concerned, um, like I mentioned earlier, insurance will cover, uh, will pay for silver fillings or silver, you know, uh, restorations. They, they will also pay for white colored fillings, uh, which would be called the composite resin fillings, up to the back teeth. However, uh, re reimbursements from the government is not that high. So a lot of Japanese dentists attempt to sort of try to sway you into going for the ceramic stuff. Okay. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's all about, I think, uh, you know, in Europe or um, definitely in Australia, they're very uh, progressive uh, too, but we're, we're shifting more towards conservative type treatment now. Yeah. And the insurance type restorations done in Japan there's a lot more drilling that's necessary to take care of a cavity in order to make these fillings retentive. Mm. And um, the materials used right now are relatively hard. So you have okay. these, the, the palladium is very expensive now, so they're switching more towards cobalt, uh, silver, um, sometimes even gold, gold, gold is expensive too, but in order to, cobalt is very hard, palladium is hard too. So you know, you have to drill a certain way in order for it to be effective. But at the same time, in order to protect the surrounding teeth, besides it, when the patient bites down, you need a certain thickness. So if it's rather thin, the dentist would rather drill out. That okay. So, yeah, so that's all, that's very technical, but, um, you know, certain areas where you can really uh, get away with filling very conservatively and small and putting filling. Uh, white color fillings, resin filling. In the case of Japanese health insurance, then, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. after 10, 15 percent. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. The last thing I wanted to touch on um, is uh, sort of pain management with uh, dental treatment. So, um, yeah, I had a, a lot of uh, fillings done when I was a kid and I had uh, my first dentist was, um, uh, what's the... Uh, Low levels of empathy when it came to like the pain <laughs> of a little wussy little kid. Um, my mother um, just thought that I was being a, a little wuss and so put up with uh, him for a little while and then sort of looked around and found another dentist and then she realised, oh, actually, he's not still a bit of a wuss but wasn't as bad. It was actually that dentist who was, um, you know, uh, um, who could have been a little bit more <laughs> empathetic. Um, but, uh, coming to Japan, then I, I heard, uh, a lot of stories. People say, Oh, don't go see dentists out here. They're really bad. Um, and had a lot of people who had bad experiences and painful experiences with uh, dentists. Um, is there a sort of part of the you know, Japanese culture of just having to put up with pain? And if you go see the dentist, you're going to be in pain and you just got to gum on through it. Um, and is, is that changing at all? And, um, yeah, have, have you seen, uh, have you noticed any sort of differences between your practice in the States and practice here in terms of pain management with dental procedures? Yeah. So I think um, just like you, I grew up in the generation where my dentist never gave me aesthetic. So I grab onto the dear old handle and you can see like these call marks on the handle, right? Where people were actually, you know, and just bear with it. And my yeah. mom, would, you know, just go in there and yeah. feeling that, you know, your, your boy, you know. But um, yeah, so I think... Um, one of the reasons why a lot of the foreigners uh, have issues with uh, pain management during dental training here in Japan is because one, um, 
there's there's a difference between bone density between Caucasians, um, you know, South Asians versus the Japanese or Asians. Okay. So the the infiltration of the um, anesthetic for Caucasians versus Asians is different. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. A lot more dense bone to reach the nerve of the tooth versus you know. If you were to give the same amount of anesthetic to Japanese, they would get numb relatively quickly and efficient. You know. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, and um, and so I think that's where a lot of the dentists back in the day they were trained to just infiltrate. You know, so you have a tooth, you would just give an anesthetic around the tooth, and that would be fine. They mm. should be, uh, yeah, pain free during the treatment. However, uh, for a lot of my patients, I I have to give an extra what we call block. Well, there's a nerve that runs down on the bottom here where we get that nerve all nice and done first. We wait a good 15, 20 minutes for that to settle in. And if need be, we will give a little bit extra one or two, depending on the procedure. So I think that that within itself is different. Also, um, in my case, I use a type of um, anesthetic that I have to order you know, I, I import it from the U.S. So it was approved in Europe actually in 87. Uh, in the U.S. I think about 97, 98. Japan most probably not. But um, yeah, okay. this anesthetic is a lot more, um, it's, it gives more profound anesthesia. Okay. And so I think that whole aspect gives, you know, Japanese treatment better. So I think they're doing their thing, but they're not used to the, uh, the anatomical differences with that. Yeah. And also with regards to root canals, I think most people talk about pain during root canals. Um, the roots are relatively longer. Really? Yeah. yeah. Between, you know, Caucasians and uh, Asian teeth, Japanese teeth. So, yeah. Okay. Um, no, there's some, some terrific uh, nuggets in there. Um, to finish off with, I mean, um, in your experience, um, having patients come in, um, what are some of the maybe just sort of one or two things that you think that people in general could be doing better in terms of either um, you know, teeth hygiene or um, just in terms of their um, your frequency of checkups or, any, or anything that, yeah, dental-wise that you think people could improve on? So I think... Um for, for a lot of my patients, uh, they're very good with their um, checks, cleans. They're, they're quite regular. They come in every six months. Um, if the hygienist deems that they might need more frequent cleanings, um, she'll recommend maybe four months, three months for some people. And most people are pretty good. So I, I feel that uh, home care is very important. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big stickler about um, flossing. Actually, I was I hoping you wouldn't say that. I was yeah, hoping I know, you'd right? tell yeah. me that it was completely Flossing. unnecessary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I never used to floss till um, I got out of dental school, so you know. I <laughs> but uh, you know, growing up in Japan, floss. What, what is floss? You know, what's this little spring? How do I use it? Yeah. I had that type of mentality, but I feel that uh, for especially for uh, kids. Yeah. What I've noticed is, uh, you know, there's more access to dental care. Um, a lot of parents are more uh, proactive when it comes to um, oral hygiene for the kids. What I've noticed is uh, lately, you know, kids, teenage, teenagers, I think they're drinking more Starbucks after school, a lot of sweet, you know, frappuccinos and this and that. I see a higher caries rate, decay rate than really? in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and also with uh, the younger generation, you know, like uh, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, they're eating more uh, sticky snacks. Uh, sticky yeah. meaning like, you know, like in Japan, gumi, gumi or yeah. like jelly, jelly beans, that type yeah. of uh, gummy bears. Yeah, okay. I see a lot of that. Or some parents uh, think that, okay, you know, I want to give my kids snacks, but I don't want to give them caramel or coffee, this and that, but let's give them raisins or dried mm. fruits. But I feel that anything that's sticky is uh, making the tooth more prone to decay. So okay. I feel that for kids, um, especially uh, since I see a little bit of a rise as far as yeah. decay rate, maybe staying away from, so you know, if you talk to my 
patient to the parents. They, they always joke. You know, Anthony, you and your uh, dry fruits and raisins, yeah. But uh, it really makes a big difference. Okay. I'm trying to save it from that. With adults, um, oral hygiene, regular flossing, um, regular home care, and regular cleanings, that's, yeah. Yeah. Terrific. All right. Well, uh, I think that's a yeah, good bit of information there um, and uh, some useful information for people. Um, if people did want to get in touch with you, um, you're, you mentioned before that um, uh, you're at the Tokyo Medical and Surgical uh, Clinic in that same building. Yes. Um, so you're basically the, the floor above on the third floor. Um, do you have a website? Um, yes, I do. Yep. And uh, yeah, what are the details of your website? So um, my uh, website address is www.tcdo.jp. Yep. Perfect. Okay. And okay. Um, I'm in the. I'm trying to revamp my website. It's quite antiquated. So yeah. <laughs> hopefully by this summer it should be up. <laughs> the new one. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Well, we'll put the details uh, in the in the show notes there, and um, and we're going to have you on again uh, in the not too distant future to talk about um, one of your specialities, which is um, um, dental related joint joint uh, jaw pain jaw pain. Um, so yeah, we're, we're looking forward to uh, getting you back on and, uh, and speaking to you again then. Thank you, thank you. All right. Well, thanks again for coming on, and uh, thanks everyone for listening. All right. Thanks, Anthony. Okay. Have a great day. Take care. You too. Take care. Thanks. Bye. -bye.